You know, I talk to so many people that love the Lord, and some of them are newborn babies. And they strive so hard to do what is right. And some of them really beat up on themselves. And they don't realize forgiving yourself is a big part of salvation. Because if God accepted you, washed your sins with the blood, and brought you into the kingdom, and you don't forgive yourself, you're Past sins keep com coming up, troubling you, and you keep weeping and crying. I can remember that I was serving the Lord for years. And uh, and I did something that I thought was terrible. Somebody else would have thought it was really nothing. But, you know, the Bible says to a man that thinks something is a sin, to him it is a sin. Well, I couldn't remember, because boy, in those days, and still today, I would fall to my knees and cry. How could I have been so silly and so stupid as to do such a thing, as to hurt and offend my God so easily? And I'd be laid like this, just wanting to die, because I just could not bear the thought that I hurt him. And then like they're crying and I could see him, you know, every single time I ever went like this or like this, I could still see him. And, and I saw him go like this. I saw his arms crossed and I saw him looking at me and I saw him standing on one foot and tapping his foot. And he went, <sighs> and I'm still bawling. <laughs> and then he switches feet and he taps his other foot and he's still got his arms and he goes <sighs> like that to me. So then he comes real close and he looks at me and he said, Marion, do you think I like this? <laughs> and I looked at him and I'm like, I guess, no, I don't know, Lord. <laughs> and he said, all I want from you is to go on. Forget it. I forgot it. Go on. And then I realized the truth of the scripture that a, a good man falls down many times and gets back up and goes on. But a wicked man falls and he wallows in it. He, you know, I'm condemned. I'm going to hell. I'm going to do this. And, you know, and a lot of them get to the conclusion where, well, if I'm going to hell, then I better make it a good one. Just like that murderer, he, in a fit of anger and domestic violence, he, hurt someone bad enough to kill him and then he thinks well if I'm going to prison anyway I might as well make it a good one I might as well make it worth my while and that is a bad way to think as as you well know but I think about many times that God had changed my mind about where my heart and mind was to get me out of it and the the soul yesterday that I was talking to, she's such a precious young lady. And <clears throat> she bust out laughing when I told her, <clears throat> you misunderstand who God the Father is, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. You misunderstand them. I said, you have five babies. Those five babies, they're children. They're not adults, they're children, and they're just like you learning how to walk. So one takes a couple steps and falls. What do you do with that child? She says, well, I pick it up and let it go in its way. I said, no, if you're crying, God the Father will pick you up, and you can believe this or not believe this. I don't care, but this is what he showed me he does. He'll pick you up, and he'll rock you, he'll hold you, and he'll pat you on the butt and try to get you out of your crying jag. And, and he'll do that with you, and then he'll put you back down to try again. Now, all that patience, all that love and that care that he spends with you, you, you're going, what I did, <laughs> and that's not what he wants. He wants you to forgive yourself the way he did.
And he wants you to go on and listen to him. Because you see, as long as you're doing this, you can't see this. <laughs> as long as you're in this, you can't see him. And he wants you to see with a clear picture how much he really does love you. You're a child of God. And that makes you much different. And I remember in some of the classes that I used to teach, and I said, you know, in my head, I've got a picture of God the Father, and he's sitting on the throne. <laughs> he is such a great king, and he has billions of babies. And there are some babies that he is so thrilled with because as tiny as they are, they're crawling up at the steps at the throne and sitting on his lap. And, and what they're doing is, is they're acting like priests and kings already. And they're already doing the job that he created them to do. And so he spends a lot of special time with them. And he, he sits down and, and they're goo-gooing. <laughs> you, you have to really, really picture this. And they're goo-gooing and he's, oh, he's talking to them in their baby language. And he's holding them and he's patting them. And, and he's got way, way out there. He hears a wee small voice that's way far away from him. And you can hear him go, Dad. Dad. <laughs> now he's God. The second he hears that, he can bring it straight to him because he's God. But the point is, <laughs> if you're one of the ones that are right there in front of him, that is much better than you being way over there because chances are, he might be so busy with the ones over here and what he is doing. <laughs> and I and I think about it, how the joy that he has. And he gets one and gets real brave and stands up and does what it's supposed to do. And, and then he got that one right next to him over there, wah, crying, ah, and won't stop. <laughs> Just crying and crying and crying. So what does he do? He does what you would do. You pick it up and you hold it and you rock it. You try to get it from crying. But no matter what you do, it won't quit crying because it's really stuck on itself. <laughs> it's really wants what it wants. And so no matter what he, what he sent, sends their way, no matter what he does with them, they're still crying. <laughs> so he's not real pleased. He's not pleased with that baby, but he would never hurt it, and he would never get angry with it. It just, he doesn't enjoy it as much as the others. So he'll put it back down till it learns how to cry by itself the way you should, you see, because you can't pamper it, you can't spoil it, you can't let it think that just because it cried, you're going to pick it up and pamper it. So he has to put it back in that little crib and let it cry for a while. And I mean, it's kicking its feet and it's crying and crying, wondering why <laughs> daddy and mommy isn't coming. Because he can't manipulate God. Because no matter how you cry, that is not what caused, causes him to pay attention to you. No matter how you hurt, that's not what gets his attention. What gets his attention is obedience. That you act the way he created you to act. And I had said this before with even animals. Oh, God, he just loves the animals that act exactly the way he created them. Uh, like the one horse I had was from the time it was born, it was a stallion. It, it was, it was a, a colt. He come charging out to the to the females. His nostrils flared, snorting, stomping his feet, striking. He goes up next to them, looks at them with his arched neck and chest, stomping his feet. That's unusual for a baby to do. And God said to me when I saw that, I thought, "Wow, he's just born." And he's these most of the babies I see would go up to the mares which is what he went up to, but he was already boss. <laughs> They'd go up to the mares and their mouth would work like this. They wanted to nurse. And so they would go up because they were afraid of the nurses, the, the mothers that weren't their uh, mother. So their mouths would work like this. 
<laughs> but not this one. <laughs> and God spoke to my heart and he said, you see that, Marion? Oh, did I get the greatest joy out of him. He is exactly what I created him to be. He is to come out stomping, stomping. He's, to, he's got a lot of growing up to do, but I am so pleased with such an animal. So you have a dog. And that dog, you don't have to train it to protect you. You don't have to train it to do anything. That dog will love the family, love everything, love you. Never hurt a single soul. But the section, the second the danger comes, there they are, ready to protect. Because it comes natural for God put it in them. That's why you have that dog. And, and God let me know. He's well pleased with that. Because that dog won't let anything cross his territory to bring harm to his family. But you take a dog that you train to be mean, you train to be cruel, you train it to hate everybody because you want everybody afraid of you. You want everybody to know, don't come near you, because you're filled with this pride. Look at this animal I've got. Look at how he's terrorizing. Well, there's something wrong with your thinking, because if you had any brains at all, you wouldn't want a dog like that. I don't know how you can uh, uh, get a dog to, to uh, obey you except out of fear. Who wants, who wants an animal that, that loves them or obeys them out of fear? It's God is, who wants that, even that animal, to obey me because it's afraid of me? In the beginning of your relationship with God, absolutely. Well, I won't touch that because, you know, the Bible said it's wrong and I don't want God to get angry with me, so I won't touch that. That's fear. That's reverence. That's what you need. You need to do that because if you don't reverence him, that means great respect. When you come, when you come into his presence, you come with, oh, this is God. This is, you don't come into it because, well, we get, we have him pouring on us and he called us friends and he calls, and you have no reverence for his presence. You have no respect for why he even came because God Never comes for no reason. God always comes to bring you something. And most of the time when he blesses you in a congregation, he is coming to you to let you feel his presence so that he can draw you at home into the word and make you want more of it. And so the only way you feel his presence is when you're obedient. But you haven't captured that. You haven't come to that place yet you haven't realized that's why you don't always feel the presence of God on your prayers because you're not pleasing him you're not pleasing to him you're very selfish you're very self-centered you're very I me and all else pertains to you you don't like this you want to talk to him about it. you don't like that you talk to him about it you you, you want this changing life you talk to me you don't listen you do not listen if you would talk to him about it and then carry and listen, sometimes he'll say, that's not the way to go. That's not me. Come, go this way. But see, you don't stay there. You're, everybody says, talk to God, talk to God, talk to God. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to talk to God. I talk to him all day long. I tell him all about this and I tell him all about that. Well, you know, when you grow with God in only certain aspects of God. And and you grow, oh, you do this all the time. I, I sing and praise him and I don't do nothing else. Or, oh, I read my Bible all day long and I don't do nothing else. Uh, I have God and I, I minister all day long and I don't have nothing else. Well, he sees this, 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 and this coming out of you. And he can't find you. <laughs> Where's it, where's, where is she at? Because there's no balance to what you believe. There's no order in what you believe. There's no way. And so what they did in church is they put balance and order 
according to the way they believe. According, well, God showed me this. Never mind that they're still living like demons and devils. Never mind that they're not going all the way with God and they're still holding on to stuff. Never mind. Well, never mind those things. But God showed them this, what you need to do, what you need to have, what you need to believe, what you need to say, what you, what you, what you. Never mind. They never tarried in front of him to find out what they needed, what they needed to do, what they needed to hear, what they needed to know. Oh, well, we got it. We understand it. Hey, all I got to do is read my Bible over and over and over and over and over and force it into me. I've got to pound it into me because if I don't, I might lose it. If I don't, oh, you weary him. You literally, if, if it wasn't true that you couldn't grieve the Holy Spirit, he would never say, grieve not the Holy Spirit. If it wasn't true that he, you couldn't weary him, uh, he would have never said to the disciples, oh, how long must I suffer you? And you know why he said that to them? Because they didn't get it. Because he walked among them and talked among them, and they still didn't get it. And even the, the transfiguration on the, on the mount, even Peter was still in his flesh. Oh, well, let's build a tabernacle here and one for here. He was still in his flesh. He didn't get it. After Jesus Christ died, some of them got it. And then after they, some of them even ministered, some of them got it. And there's no room in the interpretation of understanding who the apostles were or whatever for them to grow and change. There was no room. Take it to the letter of the law. Take it to the letter. Literally, this means this, 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 and this. Well, never mind that he said this over here. And then he said this over here, which seems opposite. Common sense don't tell you that he grew out of this and went into this. That as he was growing and changing, common sense don't tell you that he was just like you. He was writing letters to the epist with the epistles to the churches. And he was giving instructions. Never mind that he had to still be perfected. Never mind that he had to have understanding. And the churches, what they did with what uh, God said was unbelievable to me. And, and it's still, it's unbelievable of, of Romans chapter 1 and chapter 2, the, the beginning of chapter 2. And how in that day they took one sin, men with men, another sin with women with women, and we did not count all those other sins as reprobate. And the reason for it is, is most people in church do that. Most people do those things. They, they go home with a message that, that, uh, that the pastor gave them and he preached and their children or their spouse, they don't agree with them. So what do they do? They debate it. They fight. They argue. Not of God. Never mind. They are. <laughs> I got blessed in church today. He come down. He showed me I'm okay. He came strictly to bless me. Of course he did. He wanted to bless you with the truth. He wanted to lead you into all truth and take you out of all unrighteousness. But when it actually came upon you at home, your choice was to believe you already have it. Not only nobody to tell me. I already have it, and I don't need you to tell me anything. And so if you don't believe the way I believe, then you're in trouble with God. And you grow like that. You go to church again, and you do the same thing. Oh, I can tell you every single word that pastor said. Look at me. I know everything. Look at me. I, you know, hey, look at that idiot sitting on the couch over there that won't go to church. Look at that jerk over there that won't pay attention. 
That's how dumb they are. But me, <laughs> I pay attention to everything. <gasps> every word he says, I write it down every day. And oh, I love to seek him just the way Isaiah 58 says. I love to come before God. And I, I do it so that I, my voice, I can prove my voice is heard on high. And I come strictly to bite, to smite, and to fight. That's all I'm after. Oh, I'm a warrior. <laughs> I am a prayer warrior. And, and you know what? You see that guy over there? That guy has been doing wrong for how long? And he needs to be pulled down. So I'm a warrior. warrior. <laughs> don't tell me this don't happen because I've been there. One woman says, punch him in the mouth until he learns better. She's about, at the time I was probably about 40. And, and she's about 75 years old. And she's praying like this. I would be scared to to pray like that. But she knows everything. She knows God. She's had God and she can really let them have it. <laughs> Took me a while before I figured it all out and understood there was no God in that woman at all. Because you have to ask yourself a question. Where is the love? Where is the forgiveness? Where is the understanding? Where is the fear of God? I won't tell you that I am not engaged in prayer that pulls down strongholds because I am. That's not the problem. The problem is, is I wouldn't dare tell God to get a hold of you and shake you and beat you and do whatever because I wouldn't want that to come back on me if I was a parishioner that had no authority to touch anybody else's life like that. Because you see, a person who goes to church has no calling like that, has no right to touch anybody else. But everybody is called of God. The Bible says we are to do this and we are to do that because they take it literally to where they want to take it. Never mind they have a bunch of children they should be at home with. Never mind they have a husband that they should be washing dishes for and they should be cleaning and they should be doing everything to please him to have supper ready when he comes home from work. Never mind those things. I belong to Jesus and he anointed me to be able to do everything. So I can run off and bake for the church. I can run off and cook for the church while mine are home fending for themselves. That's why he said, you see, that's why it was said that if you don't take care of your own household first, you are worse than an infidel. Because in those days, women and men were doing the same thing. They were running off, being next to the pastor, always being with him, traveling with him, doing everything with him, and deserted their wife. Oh, yeah, but the Bible says that he who doesn't leave father and mother is not worthy of me. The Bible says that. You will never convince me that he meant that. He meant don't put them first, put him first. But he didn't mean to desert them to put him first because that's not what he's after. He knows, common sense will tell you, he knows you have to take care of them as a man. But you're so ignorant of that reality that you never take care of them. It's going to be okay. God will take care of them. It's not the way it goes. He gave you a responsibility. You chose a wife. That's a responsibility. You chose to have children. That's another responsibility. You have to take care of those responsibilities, just like I told you about tithe. Tithing is you cannot tithe on the money you owe. It belongs to the lender. Your tithing comes with whatever's left over after paying your bills. That's what you tithe on. That's your first fruits. But they don't tell you that. They tell you deep, deep and take. So if you've taken uh, 
So if the electricity is going to be cut off because you've given to the church and your children are in the winter without electricity because you gave that money to the church, something is wrong with your head and something is wrong with the church to receive it. To, to really know that you are that poor in the head that you don't know that you've got to pay your bills so you can have a nice warm house for kids. But you know, there's people out there that they do not rightly discern anything. They go by their emotions, how they think and how they feel and what's happened to them of the past and they don't ever want it to happen again. And, oh, God is just with them. He's going, yes, yes, he is. And he's going to pull you through it all. But he is not going to do it by helping you destroy your family first when you should be taking care of them first. You know, the job of going out there and working with that pastor belongs to the one who has no children, who has no wife who has, let them be the ones to go do it. That's not your call. I told you about the uh, the one person that said about uh, the pastor has holes in the roof, so he goes, climbs up, and he starts working on his roof, and his parishioners, he tells them, if you loved God, you'd be right here with me fixing this roof. So they drop everything at home, and they go, and they help him fix the roof. So then Satan says to him, if you loved God, you'd be over at home taking care of your family. So he drops everything with the pastor and he goes over there and takes it. Now, how do you know which one's which? How do you know which one's telling you the truth? Common sense will tell you that. What are you? What kind of person are you that you can desert your children because your pastor makes you feel guilty for not giving and doing? Well, I got to pay the light bill. Well, why did you bother to get a church if you didn't have the money to to pay the light bill? I, I'm serious. You, you're the businessman. You made you made the gospel a business. Why do they have to pay the light bill? They got it, their light bill of their own. And if anything, you should have enough money in your coffers before you even start to be a pastor to help them out. You say, well, that's impossible. I can't. Oh, no, it's not. Oh, no, it's not. Now, I'm not telling you that every man and every woman that has a church that needs the lights and needs people to help, I'm not telling you that's wrong. What I'm telling you is wrong is to force others into subjection to it to be the answer to your problem, to be the one that comes and saves you with no thoughts to their families. That's what I'm telling you is wrong. That's what I'm describing to you is wrong. It's not wrong for you to pay 10% of what you owe. That's not wrong for you to do that. That's fine. What's wrong for you is to put them so much first that, it, and like I said, the woman, she picked up orphans and God showed me immediately. There were people there that could take care of those orphans. But she wanted to be seen. She picked up these orphans. So she goes home with these orphans, barely having enough to feed her own children. She takes from her children and she feeds them. She takes clothing, toys, everything her children has, and she sells it so she can continue to keep these orphans. So now she has nothing. Her children have nothing. She has nothing. So what does she do? Oh, I was taught to go to the Americans. Oh, God will convict them. God will prove to them. They better do something. So she, she goes to the Americans. They've got big hearts. They'll give. Never mind that if you ask for $500 in that country, it blows up to 5000 So what she do, she, she goes to an American. You have to give me this money. I have these orphans, and if you don't give me that money, you're going to be responsible for those orphans. 
Oh, no. That's like going to the Winn-Dixie building and the guy that owns it because it's empty and telling him, God told me, you better give me this building for a food bank because if you don't, you're going to become responsible for every hungry person in the area. And you know what he did? He laughed at him because the scripture is true. You cannot go to somebody else and tell them what to do with their money. But they do it all the time. If you give me a thousand dollars, God will give you this. You're telling people what to do with their money. You're buying and selling the gospel. Ah, God will bless this scripture for you. Well, God's going to bless that scripture for them anyway, because they love God and they're working for God, not you. And like I said before, then you have the ones that say, well, after they become very rich and have everything on the backs of the poor, instead of giving it back or working towards that, they sit down and they say, well, I, I'll rebuke anybody that, that buys and sells the gospel anymore because that's wrong. <laughs> He's rich. He's already made himself rich and done it for 20 years. Now he's repented and he's going to rebuke people because he's going to give them the what for because now he found out it's wrong. Never mind it took him 20 years to find it out. Never mind he took all of that money off those people. I don't see him giving a penny back. I don't see him trying. And he, oh, they run off to other countries. They have to have a new jet for another country. And they're slaughtering children in this nation, and I mean slaughtering them. They're going into the classrooms and wanting to teach them about sex at five years old. They're slaughtering their minds and their hearts. Where are you? Where are you in prayer? Where is the crier that cries out to God to stop these atrocities? Where's the crier? Oh, you're busy making an impression with so-and-so because he's running for office and making an impression with so-and-so because, so you're, you're, oh, hey, look at me. I'm associated. And you haven't left one finger for the poor. And, well, I have all of these people and, and, and they answer the prayer line. And the prayer line will tell you, we don't have time to listen to your story. We don't have time. We have things we have to do. We have, we, we have books to sell. We have, we just can't, we don't, we'll pray with you. Yeah, they pray, boom, and you're gone. But as far as ministering goes to them, taking the time to hear them, to comfort their hearts, to lead them closer to Jesus Christ, I don't have time for it. I really don't have time for it because you're afraid. You're afraid you've experienced it before because the little bit of information that you have in your heart, the little bit of understanding you have for God, it doesn't work in ministering to people because you don't have enough to minister to them. So therefore they turn on you because they look at you and they think, you promised me this and you promised me that. The person who really has God doesn't have to concern himself about that. God will always be there. The so-called prophet, <laughs> he he's over there begging God, don't make this prophecy come true. Because if you don't, they're going to make fun out of me, and they're going to this, and they're going to that, and everybody's going to know I'm a fraud. So please, 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 make it come true, make it come true. <laughs> and you know what they do? They usher in the Antichrist. So they distract you. They want your mind off of what they're doing, just like the politicians do. And they distract you. Jesus, you, you know, Revelation says the Antichrist is coming. So they, you know, you, how many hits you can get from just putting the word up Antichrist and boom, everybody is there. They want to hear what you have to say. Something's wrong. If you talk about it, boom, there they are. If you talk about serving Christ, and finding Jesus Christ, I don't think it's, <laughs> uh, although lately there's been a lot more that won it than didn't because they're finding out your frauds. 
So what what do you do? You you uh, continue on your way, on your very way, because you've got God, and it doesn't matter what happens to them all. You know you've got God, and we're not going to have a future. So who cares what happens to these babies over here? Who cares if this child gets raped, molested, and even mutilated? Who cares? God says He's coming back for us. Ooh. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to be in your shoes for anything. I am serious that you can be so desensitized to what is happening to God's creation that you're not crying for God to break the power of these evils. Oh, but he, the Antichrist is coming. You can't break it. It's, it's inevitable. Accept it. It's the time. How do you know it's the time? Jesus said that nobody knows the day or the hour that Jesus is coming back. The word of God says it. So if nobody knows the time, what are you doing preaching and teaching that the time is coming? Of course there is a time coming. And I've preached on it myself. There is a time coming and you better be ready. So in order for you to be ready, I know you have to straighten up this and this. But to preach it and tell people uh, that there's no future. And, you know, the Bible wants you to fight the devil to the last breath. And what I mean by fight the devil, and I don't mean casting out demons or anything like that. What I mean by is, well, fight isn't this right word. It's resist. Resist his power to take over your nation. Resist his power to reach into lives and do what he wants to with it. But you're in La La Land. You can't be called to prayer for that. It's inevitable. Look at that. You have to accept it. You've got to leave them go. Oh, there's, there's no use. In God. God's not going to intervene. He's not going to do nothing. He is going to let because the Antichrist has to come. Where do you ever Warn people that Jesus is coming. That it's not the Antichrist you have to be afraid of. It's Jesus Christ that you have to make sure everything is right with. But no, oh no, not you. You, hey, you know prophecy. You know. <laughs> and, and like one of them said, well, I know what edification is. Sure you do. You know how to build up your church. You know how to build them up to get you more money. You know how to build them up for this. But do you know how to build up the soul to be ready when Jesus Christ comes? Oh, yes, I do. I preach this message. Sure you do. You've married and gotten in marriage and you've done other things and you do all those things. If the gift of God that he has given you was everything, you would be on top. If the anointing that God has given you was everything, you would be on top. If the knowledge, you'd be on top. If the study, you would be on top. But you see, if you haven't experienced salvation, experienced him as a person, who he tells you plainly, he will manifest himself to you if you really sincerely want him. But oh, no, no, you can't. I've heard preachers say, you can't captivate every single thought. There's no way. The Bible says captivate every thought and bring it into captivity of Christ. That means you've got to take all those thoughts and talk to God about them and bring it under the blood. But you don't do that because, hey, you don't have to. It's once saved, always saved. Hey, I don't have to do none of that stuff. Just like the Catholic that said, you're so stupid. You work all the time to keep your garment clean. I don't have to. I can play from from uh, from Monday clear to Saturday where I take confession and go to communion and start all over again. I don't have to concern myself about sin because God is with me. In all my dirt, in all my filth, he is with me.
Never mind in Jude it's written that you pull them out of the fire, hating the garment that was spotted. Hating it. Never mind that Peter said that when you go back into sin after being washed by the blood, that you are returning to your own vomit like the dog does his. Never, those things aren't, they're not real. Never mind that it says that it's a fearful thing to fall into the hand, hands of the living God when you make the blood of Jesus Christ count for nothing. What did the blood of Jesus Christ count for? It counted for washing away your sins. But when you willfully and deliberately dirty your garment, what other sacrifice do you have for sin? It's gone. You, you washed it away. I don't want it. I don't have to do that. I don't have to obey. I don't have to read the word. I don't have to do anything. Well, I'm going to tell you what. There are times in your life that God doesn't always force you to read the Bible because he knows he wants you to read some of it and work with him with it until you get it here and here permeated in reality. But if you read it like a dead word and you just read and read and read and read and then you read it and read and read and read and over again, you'll know all the scriptures, you'll know where they're at, but you won't know how to live it. Because it isn't because you name it and claim it. It isn't because of the, it's because he died for you and that is real and you've got to treat it with reverence and holiness and righteousness and never let any of that touch your spirit. Touch your life. My goodness, what is the matter with you? Why? Why do you think it's okay? Now, like the one I talked to yesterday, my goodness. She just condemned herself. God don't want you in that place. He wants you to forgive yourself. He doesn't want you to keep on wallowing and trying to get up. He picked you up. You see, you have all of these different personalities. And when they call, the instant they call, the Lord will reveal what they need. Some and I'm telling you, some are so far away from God that they need the truth. And you have to know that no matter what they think and believe, no matter how strong they sound, you have to tell them the truth. And a lot of times I've had to say, hey, there's no love in that. You need a good dose of the love of the Lord. You might think that God is with you, and you might think, and, uh, like the one woman that said, Sometimes I feel like I'm the only one serving God and everybody all around me doesn't know him. Sorry. He has probably spoken to every one of them and he is working with them and you have no idea. And you're up there. You're the best there is. Everybody else. Because you have no love. No real love. You're not looking at that one if you think they don't have him crying, Lord. Please. Send him what he needs. You're not doing that. You're going, hmm, <laughs> look at me. <laughs> I'm the only one. Something's wrong with your salvation, if that's how you think and feel. I don't want to go too long on this. I just want to uh, bring out what God lays on my heart. So we're going to stop this here. <laughs>